good place now. You are listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Live Your True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. Have you ever wondered about where you came from and who you're related to? You know, I find it very interesting when we think about family. We wonder, you know, who are our ancestors and what was going on back then? I think a lot of us know our immediate family. Some of us have small families. Some of us have larger families. But it's interesting to think about genealogy, to think about ancestry, to think about from whence we came, you know. And I know that lately everybody's been doing these uh, these tests to find out, you know, what part of them are from this country or what part's from that country. And, you know, I agree and disagree on some of that stuff. But when you find someone that's doing it, in a really historical way where you're not having to spit into a tube or figure that out, but you're actually being able to see the genealogy and see from whence you came. It's pretty powerful stuff. And so joining me today on Live Your True Life Perspectives, a friend of mine, Dan Nelson. Dan is the creator and owns the company Dan Sester's Genealogy. Dan, great to have you in studio today. How are you Thank doing? Thank you. Doing great. Glad to be here, Ashley. I'm glad to have you here. And, you know, I think it's interesting to know where we came from. And I, I come from a small family, a pretty small family, and I don't know a lot about my family. And I think a lot of people out there listening to the show right now probably don't either. Right. I think that's a pretty common occurrence. And what happens is people get older, they start to realize, you know, they're in more touch with their mortality and they start to realize, gee, I haven't gathered those stories. I haven't done anything with all that information and all that knowledge. Uh, a common time is you go to a funeral and Uncle Fred passes away and you say, man, we should have gotten all of Uncle Fred's stories, but we didn't. So let's get together before Aunt Edna dies and get those stories. Well, you all go home, you all get busy, you're all well intended. But, you know, two years later, you're at Aunt Edna's funeral and those stories are now have disappeared, lost uh, from your family. And everybody says, boy, I wish I'd paid more attention to Grandpa when we were kids and he was telling those stories. And uh, so we try and help people basically intersect that and grab all that information before it's lost. We help people be responsible with their legacy because most people don't know what to do uh, with, you know, that kind of knowledge and information in those stories. It's powerful, and it's interesting, too. I, I believe that, especially when we really care about certain family members, we don't want their legacy to die. We don't want their imagery to die. We want to stay connected with that person. And I think that's a, a, there's kind of a duality there. And I think that you're right when you're actually – compiling this information it's kind of part of respecting them and actually showing credence to their life here on the planet yep absolutely and you know what we try and capture is not just the pictures and the historical documents but the stories the stories about these people And a lot of those stories are out there they're just hidden and people don't even know people are part of their family so we go and grab that information so that they can find out things that make it more interesting about their ancestors and where they came from not just names and dates but actual here's what they did and uh, here's what they accomplished and most people think oh all my ancestors are boring farmers well they probably all weren't boring farmers we'll find some stuff out about them that uh, tells you they weren't you know it's interesting one of my favorite shows of all times and anybody that's listening to the show for any length of time knows that one of my favorite characters is Fraser Fraser Crane from the Fraser show and in one of the episodes, you had Frazier and Niles, his brother, that were going to the Antiques Roadshow. And their father had this antique clock that was in the shape of a bear. And it was from, um, I guess, a lineage line from Russia. And so when they actually showed the bear clock at the Antiques Roadshow, if anybody's seen the Antiques Roadshow, they decide if it's real or fake. And, and so the guy's like looking at it and he's like, you know what? This is real. This is real Russian. This is real Romanov. Um, you know, this clock, they only made a certain amount of clocks and they all went to the Romanov family. And so they're all thinking, cha-ching! And they're like, oh my God, we're actually related to royalty. And it's such a funny show. I love this show, but the funny thing later on is you find out that they're related to the prostitute that stole the clock from the royalty. <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting how we all want to know where we came from. And it would be interesting to know if you do have famous or royal ancestry. Have you come across any uh, royalty in doing some of this? You might not be able to say names, but have you come across any of that? Yeah, there's absolutely people that do tie, tie into royalty. Uh, probably the biggest misnomer is it's typically not the king or the prince or somebody like that that says, hey, let's just, my kid's going to go over to America, you know, give up the castle, give up the moat, take a chance with the Indians and the smallpox and 
whatever coming across on the boat. So it's typically somebody that was sent as an agent. Uh, a lot of times the first child got the land, the first male, the second male went in the military, and the third male became a minister. Well, ministers were sent to America uh, to convert the natives or convert people that had chosen other religions. So most of the people that came from royalty that ended up in America were through the son that was a member of the ministry. That's interesting because I, I think we all wonder, you know, is there royalty in, in our family dynamic? Have you come across fame? So I know that another thing that people want to know is, you know, are they are they related to famous people? I actually had a friend of mine uh, recently that found out about her father, and her father's actually a famous country western singer, or I guess they don't go by country western anymore, country singer. <laughs> and um, she was adopted, though, and her parents, like, got real with her. And, and so they've actually kind of made a – They've actually kind of gotten together and made a connection, and she's actually spent a few times with them, which is really interesting. But have you found any fame in certain lines that nobody really expected it? Yeah, probably further back than just the immediate parent. I've had three um, clients that were adoptees, and none of them came directly from somebody that was famous. But one of them about, I think it was about four or five generations back, uh, one of their ancestors was uh, George T. Stagg. If you're a bourbon drinker, you'd you'd know what George uh, T. Stagg bourbon was. And uh, the the Buffalo Trace Distillery, which is a pretty famous uh, bourbon distillery, so he came from that line, and he had no idea uh, he was adopted, and uh, so that was pretty uh, cool. Uh, a number of my clients, it's sort of amazing how many have descended from Salem witches. There were only 19 people hung as Salem witches. Nobody was burned at the stake in America, even though you'll see the little pictures of the flames and all that. That was all Europe. We're far more sophisticated here. We just hang people, but. Uh, there were 19 people, and four of those people have been my clients, but then um, descendants of the witches. And, but there's also people that were deciding that the witches should be burned and hung. There were accusers. There were people defending them. And so it's amazing how many of my clients, keep in mind a number of mine since I live in Dallas, are southern-based, uh, end up having those roots that tie back to the, the Salem witch trial. So that's probably sort of the craziest thing. They could have used a therapist back then. They definitely... Uh, <laughs> Thank you for the endorsement. <laughs> there you go. No, it's true. It's, it, and it's interesting historical reference here. You know, all the stuff that we've gone through as a society, as a culture, and, and I think it's really interesting on your own ancestry, and I'm looking at the book right now. It's here on the studio on the table. Did you learn something that you weren't expecting to learn? Uh, yeah, as I got further back, um, I did. Of course, even uh, probably – was the most interesting was my great great grandfather. He was a Civil War soldier, and he was shot in the eye outside the Battle of Vicksburg. And he kept a diary before the Civil War, during the Civil War, after the Civil War. All the letters home were kept, and uh, I'm sure I got his DNA, and that's why I'm interested in this. But the detail in his diary uh, of what a foot soldier, you know, dealt with during the Civil War was pretty darn interesting. So I was probably the biggest uh, surprise. But for other clients, there's been a lot of surprises. You know, there was one that said all my ancestors are boring. Well, it turned out his ancestor, Benjamin Smith, uh, was a Revolutionary War soldier. And, uh, you know, researching somebody named Benjamin Smith isn't the easiest thing to do when you're a family historian. But uh, I found out that uh, not only was he a Revolutionary War soldier, but he was captured, sent to Canada, escaped, joined uh, American privateer, basically became a, a pirate um, going after British shipping, got caught again, got put in a hospital ship in New York City Bay, uh, which was really just a prison ship, escaped from it, uh, passed out while receiving 500 lashes, got well again, and escaped again. And so this guy's like ready for a, a miniseries of uh, patriotic movies uh, come back into style. So they were quite excited to find out they had an ancestor uh, like that. Wow. Anybody related that you found related to Elvis or Elvis Presley? No, I don't think there's been any Elvis ones in there. Family I just uh, did uh, was, uh, you mentioned country western, so there was a guy named Bob Wills uh, who's out of Turkey, Texas, and uh, he ran the uh, barbershop next door to their drugstore, so they had that connection. And uh, apparently Bob Wills owed them money last uh, they talked oh. about it. <laughs> I don't think they're going to collect. He's long gone. But So you do find those kind of connections. Uh, another family I just worked on was tied into Patrick Henry, you know, give me liberty or give me death. And uh, so that was sort of neat for that. They knew they had Henry's in their family, but they had no idea they were related to or related probably the most famous uh, Patrick Henry. Uh, I think I've had about five or six families where the richest person in America in the 1600s was a guy named Augustine Warner. 
and they uh, descend from him. They didn't get any money. There's you know nothing left for him, but uh, they tie into the Washingtons, Robert E. Lee, Queen Elizabeth. So if they get back to Augie in the 1600s, there's a good chance that uh, they'll tie into some other famous people. Well, you know, uh, one question before we go to break real quick. Um, George Washington, anybody that you have worked with that is related to George Washington? Well, George Washington has no known uh, descendants. It's actually believed that he was sterile, but uh, he had stepchildren. But there are people related to George Washington in terms of they were tied to his brothers, his uncles, his aunts, and things like like that. Even in my own family, uh, George Washington grew up with some Stevenson boys, and those Stevenson boys are supposed to be in my family. Now, I've yet to, you know, be able to pour concrete on it, but uh, I have a lot of information about that and continue to work on it. Because you're never really done unless you get everybody back to Adam and Eve and you can say, okay, we're done now. That's awesome. When we return, we'll be talking more about that. I want to hear more about the Stevenson brothers and this connection, too. I think yeah. a lot of us are very interested in that old school and in that historical reference. Stay tuned. We're going to return, we'll be talking more about this, more about ancestry, and we'll be talking more with Dan. Live Your True Life Perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back in. I'll be back this time in two shakes. Turn it up and jump in the deep end on Perspectives. Now, here's Ashley. Welcome back live to Live Your True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. On today, we're talking about genealogy. We're talking about history, about family history, and understanding who you're related to and who you're not. Right before the break, Dan was actually telling me about, well, I was asking some information about George Washington, and if he knew anybody that was connected to George. And you were bringing up the Stevenson brothers. Tell me a little bit more about that. Sure. So actually what happened was my grandmother's cousin uh, was still alive when I started working on the Stevenson family. And he said that uh, George Washington used to hang out with these Stevenson brothers. They were in the war with them and they grew up together. And you're like, sure, right. You know, he also said he's, we were related to Adelaide Stevenson, which we were not. But, you know, anytime you I, I sort of view it as like putting a puzzle together and you get pieces that fit and pieces that don't. But the more pieces you collect, the more likely you'll get it to look like the top of the puzzle box. And uh, so I sort of kept that note and I followed up on it. And sure enough, I came across a magazine article that referred to the Stevenson brothers. Sometimes they're called Stinson brothers. Those were sort of interchangeable back in the day. Um, that lived with George Washington. So I followed the stories, and sure enough, back in Fredericksburg, Virginia, uh, him and his mom lived with a, a Stevenson, Stinson family, and uh, he, they grew up, you know, sort of that age when boys are wrestling and, you know, Indian wrestling and fighting and, you know, sort of developing their uh, early manhood. Uh, they were all together. So that was pretty interesting. But I haven't figured out how to get from those Stevensons to my furthest back 1799 Stevenson in Virginia. So still working on that. I was at the Library of Virginia just this past month uh, working on it more. So That's really interesting. Um, I, I want to ask you about mobsters in a second, but I, I do have a question for you. How do you get started you know, in a career like this? I mean, because this is not your mainstay career. You don't, I don't, I've, I've actually not ever run up against anybody that's ever done it before. You're the first. So how did you fall into this? Yeah, it's sort of random. I think there's some DNA, uh, you know, as I said, from my great-great-grandfather. And then uh, my friends, and, and they mean it as friends, think I have a weird brain because I can keep track of all these different families. I've got six projects going right now, and I have to keep track of all those different families. You know, we've done uh, 53 books, and yet I can – if I talk to the client about somebody in their family or if something seems familiar and I'll say, I've done this family before, I'll go look at my narrative that captures it all and, and find uh, that, yep, that was right. I did research this family before and uh, connects back, saves the, the client some uh, time because uh, I already have uh, researched that family. So uh, I did this all before the Internet for my own family and my wife's family. And so I think that made me a better researcher because before the Internet, it wasn't easy. I mean, you had to spend time in libraries. You had to call people. They had landlines, so that helped. You know, And uh, you'd call people in towns that people uh, lived in that had similar last names. You'd write letters. You'd, there were a lot of bulletins, you know, the Burgess family book or the you know those kinds of things. So you'd spend a lot of time uh, checking places out. Uh, I traveled a lot for my career job, and so that allowed me to go to a lot of places where I wouldn't have been able to do that if I didn't have that kind of position. Um, so I just kept building and doing more and more. But uh, the great thing about 
what sort of led me to have it be a career is we'd go on uh, go on backpacking trips with guys of mine in the business world and when you're on a backpacking trip or a fishing trip or whatever you just run out of stuff to talk about so I'd share some of the wilder stories from family history and so one of the guys on the trip um, said hey I'd like you to research my wife's family and sure I'll do that and I'm envisioning stapling some papers together and all he says no I want to pay you to do it so I thought, oh, if he wants to pay me, I better figure out how to do it professionally. So that's when we uh, got together and me and my wife figured figure out how to do the books. And uh, so we've continued to do the books. And we practiced on our own family to get all the lessons you learn when you become a publisher and when you become a, a family historian that's, you know, doing it for pay. And uh, so that's sort of how it just evolved from there. And now we've done 53 books. Um, so let's move along. That's a lot, 53 yeah. books. Yep. Yeah. Golly, that's interesting. I, I just think it's really powerful. I, I've never done any of this as a checkup, and it's, it's interesting. I have my own uh, ideas on the, the the spit test thing. You know, even before it came out that the, a lot of the information was being sold to you know uh, pharmaceutical companies and everything to get information on drug information. I kind of knew that that was the direction it was going, so I got scared. So you're doing it like the legitimate way, which I think is very interesting. Let me ask you, mobsters. Let's talk about that. Uh, you know, because you know, the Al Capones, the, the the different folks like that, even the Italian mobsters, the different, I mean, there's mobsters in every country, but have you come across any of that in lineage? Yeah, actually, in a, a family I worked on, it was interesting, because I think they sort of knew that there were some, some dubious characters in the past, but uh, fortunately, a lot of their stuff made the newspaper, and this was a Hungarian Jewish family out of Cleveland, and they were barbers. Well, then during Prohibition, they came up with a scheme where they were going to import hair oil from Canada. It was called Millionaire Hair Tonic, but it wasn't hair tonic. It was alcohol. So they brought it into the United States, sold it, and interestingly made a million dollars on their millionaire hair tonic before they got caught by the federal government. So, And, and the other uh, grandpa was uh, a lawyer, and uh, so he defended them. Uh, they had, got sent to jail, um, and uh, one of the brothers, while he was in prison, he was uh, he he actually murdered somebody, so he had a longer sentence. And uh, so he, as the prison barber, was sharpening his razor on the strap, and all of a sudden he slit his own throat, I guess, so he didn't have to do the time and, and uh, killed himself. But there was one good brother, it was the Arbeck family, and he uh, moved out to Salt Lake City and started his own barber shop, which you know turned into more. And uh, but he always liked sports. You don't really think about somebody a barber getting into the sports world. But he was Jack Dempsey, the world champions, uh, first agent. And uh, when I first sort of came across this, you know, a lot of stories I come across, uh, you know, I'm a little bit dubious about is this just a convenient story or is there actually truth to it? Well, sure enough, I found a newspaper article where Jack Dempsey stopped in to Provo and got a Manny Petty with Al Arbach uh, and, you know, talked about their good times together because Jack Dempsey started in Salt Lake City. So that was sort of a cool story for that family. That's really interesting. I mean, it really is. Uh, you know, in some of these situations, it's like finding that, you know, that Superman comic, one of one, you know, and the and the acid-free archival paper up in the attics, you know, and you go, wow, because it kind of is like that when you, when you think about that kind of the connection that we have. Um so, okay, so you started Dancestors. What do you think is really unique about what you do and about your company? Uh, I think there's several features, but one of the key ones is my wife just has a casual interest in uh, history and genealogy. So she serves as my editor and my art director, and what's really good is she makes sure that we're making it uh, a product that the average person will enjoy. Genealogists, just like any other profession, have a tendency to write things a certain way, but they may not be that meaningful uh, to regular folks. So she works real hard at making sure that I bust all that up and it's very clear and make it entertaining. Uh, secondly, uh, a lot of my clients uh, have been uh, big you know, business leaders and, and really busy people, and so I work as the project manager and do it. I don't come to them and ask all these questions and, you know, create take away more of their limited time. I just say, what do you want? We talk about it. We agree. And then I go do it and then come back. They get as much interaction as they want during the process. But if they say, hey, just let me know when you're done, it works that way. So it keeps it easy for busy people. The other thing is, is nobody has to pay until they're satisfied. They get to completely uh, electronically 
preview the book. We make any changes that they want, and when they're ready, we publish it, and then they pay. So I'm not asking people for a bunch of money up front, and then you know it doesn't meet expectations or something like that. And that's just because I'm so. Uh, I think everybody's been so thrilled with the books we've done. I mean, one of the great things about being in this business is typically when we deliver the product to the client, it results in tears of joy. It's a great emotional uh, moment for the family, you know, to get their story. That's cool. I like that, and it's cool that you know you you kind of do all that work. And you have that dedication uh, and determination to do that. You know, I I think it's interesting. I mean, I think most people kind of feel like, you know, like you said, the guy said, well, I think everybody's probably a farmer in my family or it's not that interesting. And then some of us have, you know, major beliefs that we must be related to, you know, you know, some major person, you know, and it goes back to, I guess, kind of, have you ever had anybody that, I guess was a little like the wind got out of their sail. Like they really were just related to shopkeepers and farmers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I actually had two guys in a business group that I uh, was in, uh, both had the same last name uh, and it wasn't James, but they were both grew up hearing that they were related to Jesse James. And one actually grew up in St. Near St. Joseph, Missouri. So he had more of a basis, but turned out neither of them were related to Jesse James. So yeah, that sort of burst their bubble. Um, I had another client that there there was one some things that came true and some didn't. She grew up hearing that her great 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 grandpa invented the potato chip. Um, well, he was born after the American version of the potato chip was invented, so that didn't seem very likely. So it's like, okay, is this just not a real story? But I kept digging and digging and digging, and sure enough, and this guy's name was John Addison Smith. So John Smith or John A. Smith isn't exactly where you like to start. Um, but in 1888, in the San Francisco uh, Fair, uh, he was uh, noted for producing the first uh, not only efficient potato chip making machine, but uh, one that was clean and uh, sanitary. Uh, and that was a big deal in 1888 to get food out of a machine that wasn't touched by human hands. So they put the potato in and out comes the fried potato chips. So in fact... The story she heard growing up was relatively accurate. He did invent the modern potato chip making machine and, uh, you know, went on to produce those in a, in a packing house. And so it was sort of cool to have that one validated. But another story was his son uh, supposedly married a, a, a Sears heiress and uh, they had a baby and the mom was uh, killed in a polo accident. And so the Sears family took the baby and went to Europe and raised it. But he was always sad because he had a stopwatch with uh, teething marks in it. And uh, he said it was the baby's teething marks. And so it always made him sad. So I followed up on that story. Well, first of all, none of the Sears heiresses were the right age to match up with that. Um, And then I continued to work it and work it. Turns out he married uh, the daughter of somebody in the Dumble family, which was a retailer in Bakersfield. So not quite, you know, Sears level of retail, but they were retailers. And uh, sadly, um, yes, the wife did die. I don't, I never found any about a polo accident. Uh, and, you know, you could only search so many places for polo accident. But uh, the baby was raised by the grandparents. So he basically abandoned the child versus, you know, taken to Europe kind of thing. And uh, went to sea. And uh, and he had a great time at sea. He was with, uh, sailed around the world with the uh, Dewar's label founder, George Dewar's, I think it was, um, in a yacht. And they got, uh, st- um, they got caught on a sandbar and pirates raided the ship and he had to find his way home. But I found a book that I had it all in there. So, you know, it was like the goods and the bads. So she handled it pretty well because a lot of the stories turned out to be very accurate. Some of the others didn't, you know. That's interesting. When we were trying to be talking more about some of these stories and getting into this, because this is really interesting information. So stick with us because Dan's going to continue here on our next segment talking more about this, about ancestry, genealogy, and the list goes on. So stay tuned because Live Your True Life Perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back in. I'll be back this time. You know it. I'll be back this time in two shakes. This is Jake Busey, and you're listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Live Your True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. On today's show, I've been talking with Dan Nelson. Dan 
Well, he's a genealogist. He figures out who people are related to, family, connections. We talked about a lot of stuff on the show. We talked about mobsters. We talked about, I mean, that situation about Dan, about how uh, the, the kid was taken away and then and then all this. That, that's always interesting stuff. So you were talking about the kid possibly being related to the Sears family. The wife dies in a polo accident, takes the kid back, but then we find out it's a little different than the story, but kind of somewhat of the same. And so then the the father of the child actually ends up being on a boat, you said, with doers. Tell me just a little bit more about that to refresh everybody's memory. Yeah, he basically went to sea, and uh, the story was, when I first got the story, it was with, they, they named some other sort of whiskey or something. You know, it wasn't the right one, but I worked at it, and I finally figured out it was doers. Took a trip around the world, the guy that had uh, mo- inherited most of the money uh, from the doers. A distillery in Ireland, and uh, on this trip around the world, um, a book was written afterwards, and in that book, I found her uh, great-great-grandfather in there. His name was Tom Smith. Again, not the <laughs> ideal name to work on, but it was quite a deal, and I got a copy of the book for You know, it's a pretty rare book, and uh, so I was able to to validate that. They had a lot of great stories in that family, especially being Smith, you know, because that's usually not one of the easier ones. That's got to be pretty challenging. I mean, that's like Patel, you know, like, you know, Indian name Patel or, you know, you have Smith, you have, I mean, that's, that's hard, right? It is. It is harder if you don't have some clues to work with. Of course, clients come to us from all various stages. There's people that are adopted and they really don't know anything. I had a client that really didn't know even her grandparents' names. And uh, so they ended up with two full books, you know, 500 pages, um, just working on that. But uh, I have other clients that say, I've sort of done this my whole life, and I've got a bunch of stuff together, but I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to put a bow on it. So we do that for them uh, and pull it all together so they could say, hey, you know, this didn't just get thrown in the trash when somebody passed away. It actually became something that's living, breathing, uh, because uh, one of the interesting things with these books is it's not just grandma and grandpa that like reading them. It's the millennials, too, because if you've ever tried to click around on a family tree online, it's pretty easy to get lost. It's pretty disorienting, despite all the people that create those best attempts to make it easy to follow. You put it in a book, you give them a bookmark, and people continue to read through it. They come back to it. So I'd call it a live coffee table uh, book because people continue to come back to it. One of the interesting things that uh, I just came across on the client I'm working on now was uh, he was murdered and his murderer um, to sort of atone for what he did uh, donated his skin to be used to create a skin bound book. What? Yeah. Apparently. Wait a second. Wait a second. <laughs> what? Well, okay. What happened? Yeah. So apparently they used to back in the day at times would, uh, bound books with human skin, just like you have animal leather, like in these our books. Uh, it was actually with human skin. And uh, so, yeah, it was a new thing I came across. And uh, so I've been working on uh, finding out more about that. So you're, the person you're doing the genealogy for, one of their family members was murdered? Yeah. And this is like 1700s, 1800s, you know. And then how did the skin come? This is the actual murdered person's skin? Yeah, he felt bad, and that was his sort of way to atone. Different, huh? Yeah. Back in the 1700s. Yeah, yeah. So I know. It was the first time I'd come across that. I was actually talking to somebody the other day, and they said, yeah, they'd heard that they used to bind books with skin. The other thing is when I'm in these uh, newspaper archives looking at things, you come across the article next to it. Of course, sometimes it's just interesting because, you know, something that happened in World War One or whatever. But uh, I came across one the other day. It was San Francisco, 1896. So you San Francisco's been weird for a while. There was a lady actually selling her skin because she grew a lot of skin for people to use in skin grafts. And there's a whole article about it in the paper, and she just had a excess skin. Now, I, I was I thought skin was like any other organ, you know, could be rejected. But apparently in 1896, they were willing to take her skin. Holy hand grenade, Superman. Yeah. So In 18 well, what? 96. Oh, my gosh, that's wild. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. How do you stumble upon stories like that? Is that through doing your due diligence on this genealogy, or is this like you're in the library and you're doing other due yeah. diligence and you find that? It's both, but that story was next to a story where I was you know, particularly looking for something uh, in, an old, in an 1896 San Francisco newspaper. 
So That's interesting. Very. How, so where have you traveled to? Have you had to travel all over the world to to do this stuff? I mean, to get the information and to find it, or have you been able to stay more here in the United States? Because I know you were talking about earlier about how, you know. As far as lineage is concerned, there's not like kings and queens leaving to come over here. But how do you do most of that research? Is it at local libraries around the country or how does that work? A lot of it depends what the client wants to do because some clients don't want to pay for me to travel. And I certainly understand that. So I do what I can do, you know, through the Internet, through writing, um, you know, just continuing to collaborate with people uh, to figure it out. Um, But we we travel about 50 percent of the time. So. If I'm going to Virginia, I'll be able to research multiple families while I'm back there. If we go to the New England, research multiple families. So um, if people said, hey, i got to have my ancestry done and I need it done in two weeks, then no, that probably wouldn't work for them. But if they say, hey, over the next year, I'd like you to work on this. And then we just sort of see where I run into the end of the line. Uh, a lot of people, if they came from Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, who even knows if the records exist? So what I'll encourage uh, people to do, like right now we've got a Slovakian family. They didn't know they were Slovakian, but the boundaries kept changing. And uh, so my suggestion was it'd make way more sense to hire a Slovakian researcher to see what they could find beyond what I could find versus, you know, I don't speak Slavic. And uh, there'd be no real benefit of flying me over to Prague or someplace to go uh, dig around. So uh, some families decide to do that, and some say, you know, you've uncovered enough, and that's all we really want to know. Because, you know, people have a—they a, have the interest, but they don't have an, an unlimited interest in terms of their budget. So, you know, we sort of talk about that and figure it out so that the project sort of fits their, their budget. Have you had, and I'm sure you have had, clients that they say sky's the limit, just keep going? Well, nobody's actually used those words. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I mean, like, keep uncovering, keep doing it, keep doing it. Have you had somebody that just kept pushing you and you were like, you know, they're like, you're on the trail. Keep, we want to know as much as we possibly can. Well, you know, I, I try and make sure people feel that they get good value. I did have a client that uh, his father done genealogy as a passion. And uh, so he wanted to honor his father and make sure everything didn't get thrown away. And uh, so after sorting through it, uh, he got it down to 12 boxes. So we took those 12 boxes and uh, turned them into, uh, I think it was five family books. No, four family books. And then we also took all the letters that his mom and dad wrote back and forth while his dad was stationed in Korea and put that into five love letter books. So they ended up with nine books. uh, And then everything that uh, his father collected, we also... um, backed it up, archived it, so it will never be lost, or 50 years from now, his great-great-grandson wants to pick up the trail, you know, and maybe more information's become available, then they can run with it, because it's all digitized, uh, organized, because digital records, I think, have the opportunity to survive generations. Paper records, probably not. Books, I think, have a really good shot, because people are more hesitant before they take a book and throw it in the trash, versus if it's just loose papers, typed papers. Those tend to not do real well when it comes to making it to the next generation or finding that person that has the interest to do something with it. That's true, and actually follow through and do something with it. You know, when you think when when you work on these types of projects, um, obviously you feel like family is important, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be in this yep. in, in this business. Um, do you think that it actually brings somebody? Uh, more, I guess, like support or love or care about their family to know this information. What what do you think that supplies the individual besides the knowledge? Is there something else? That's a great question because uh, I when I started out doing this, I didn't really think of that as uh, as you know the end. Uh, but people have told me, you know, at, at holidays the family gets together, the book gets opened, people are somebody's got it open in their lap. There's a person on each side. And they're saying, "Hurry up!" I just had a client who produced uh, one of each book. Well, now for Christmas, he's ordering more copies of the book because it's in such demand in their family. You know, the the sister won't let go of it and, you know, the brother wants to see it. And so, yeah, I think it does bring people closer together because it's their story. It's, you know, it's their legacy. And uh, so I think people, you know, if it's not there, then I don't know if people think about it all that much. You know, they're sort of like in the back of their mind. But when it's there in front of them, I think it's greatly unifying for families um, to um, get together with the books. The, I think the books do pull families together. It's sort of like a printed family reunion, if yeah. you will. And, of course, in the books, we have the contemporary part up front, uh, which is, you know, more modern, current pictures of all the, you know, 
alive descendants in their family. So it isn't just start with deceased people and work back. That's cool. Well, when we were trying to be talking more about that, more about um, ancestry, more about family, you know, the value of the family, I think, too, as well. Because, you know, when I talk about on the show, I talk about values. Like, what do we value? What are our morals? What are our beliefs? And a lot of us really value our family. It's one of our top things. And so definitely, if if you value family, this is definitely up your alley. And this is a definitely subject matter that really matters. So stay tuned. We'll be talking more about that. Dan will be in studio as well in this next segment, talking more about family, the family dynamic, the value of the family as well. Live your true life perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess. We'll be back in. We'll be back this time in two shakes. Get in here. You're listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Live Your True Life Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. On today's show, I'm talking with Dan Nelson about family, about genealogy, about understanding what's where we came from and who our family dynamic is. You know, a lot of us really don't know a lot of those answers to those questions. We might know our immediate family, like our brothers and sisters, mother, father, you know, grandma, grandpa, even maybe great grandmother or great grandfather, but a lot of us might not even know that information. You know, Dan, I know that you go back as far as the historical reference to examine this information and find this information, and I'm sure that you've probably found yourself in the Civil War times. Have there been any interesting, well, any interesting uh, stories about um, the past and even something that maybe people would cringe about? Because I think sometimes we have some of those amazing stories. It's like, oh, so-and-so invented this, the telegraph, or this happened, but not every story is always awesome, awesome, but have you had any interesting stories from the Civil War? Yeah, there's there's been a number. You know, the Civil War was, a, uh, anytime you have wars, it creates stories, stories of heroism, stories of people getting wounded. I mean, when people used to come back uh, from war and were wounded, they were like heroes in the town, in these small towns. Uh, one of the interesting ones I came across, and this was up in Iowa, and uh, so it was, you know, pretty well documented. Um, and I, I, I read it and I checked it again and I, I kept thinking I was doing something wrong or getting it wrong. But apparently this grandfather who was a civil war soldier married his blood granddaughter. And uh, of course, first you say, Ooh, you know, that's sort of yucky. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so I checked it out, uh, and I called the client and I said, you ever hear any story like this? And of course this is quite a ways back. You're talking civil war times. And she said, no, um, and, of course, she had the same reaction, ooh. And uh, so I said, well, you know, let's just not assume he's a dirty old man. Let me uh, work on this a little bit. But I said, you know, it could be that she had some sort of uh, wasting disease, and maybe it was a way to give her his pension income because uh, Civil War pensions could only be left to spouses. Kids didn't get them. Your friends didn't get them. Your brothers and sisters. Um, so it was a way to create, uh, you know, basically a lifetime income for her. And, uh, you know, if you get $12 a month, that was big money back in 1880s or 1890s, whenever this was, I'll, I'd have to look. But uh, so I went and uh, while I was working on it, she went and talked to the aunt that had good days and bad days. And the aunt had a good day. And she says, oh, yeah, that's true. She said that she was epileptic. And uh, that's a uh, was the reason for it. So. Then when I uh, sent away for their death certificates, they came back. He died of, you know, just something that gets old people. I forget what it was in particular. But she died two weeks later. So what I was hoping would be on the death certificate was a broken heart. But she died of whooping cough. Uh, So she didn't die from convulsions, at least from the epilepsy. So she never got to collect his pension uh, because of that. But, you know, along these same lines, I ran across a lady the other day because – Civil War widowers were highly sought after by uh, young women that were looking for an income long term because, you know, the old one foot in the grave. Well, the pension would be what they get out of it. And uh, so she collected uh, a pension for 38 years after her uh, husband, who was a Civil War veteran, passed away because she was quite a bit younger. So the last day she got a pension was 85 years after he served. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, the government was writing checks for a long time to, to some of these uh, Civil War widows and Civil War veterans. There just weren't as many of the veterans that lived as long. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. And I can see how it would be like, ooh, you know, this is this is spicy, you know. Oh, but So she basically had a disease that she was going to die. He was going to give her the money. and But then she dies two weeks. That's, that's wild. And that wasn't the only intrigue in her life because uh, she was actually— 
when I was doing the research, I'm uh, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, okay, she was born before her parents were married, which, okay, that's not unusual. That happens. But then it was like, no, she was born before her parents had met. Well, it turns out her mom uh, got her uh, got a job, you know, after she came out of the house and she was working as an upstairs maid in a wealthy doctor's house in Keokuk, Iowa. And uh, the doctor got her pregnant. And so this girl was the, the product of that, um, you know, between the doctor and the, the maid. child. Yeah, so she never let her children uh, work outside the home. You know, they were, uh, she was worried about that happening. But the weird thing when we did all this in the book, they, in, amongst their pictures was a picture of the doctor. So the doctor's picture's in the book. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. So. so. So did he raise her or was it no. some other man that raised her? No. Uh, so the... The maid, the mom, she um, married and he adopted her as his own and raised her. So mm. if you didn't do the research, you would have never known. You'd just assume, oh, that was our oldest daughter. But the dates weren't lining up uh, for it to work in terms of when he came into that part of the country and things like that. So Interesting. Yeah, it was fun. There was a lot of uh, fun stuff in that family. But And this same gal's husband, he was adopted. He's the one that went back to George T. Stagg. And he had a very Western uh sort of background, you know, more Western United States, and uh, including one of his grandpas, you know, great, 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 something like that, was in a shootout in uh, in the street in front of the San Francisco courthouse. Uh, unfortunately, he lost in the shootout. Oh. Yeah, but it was, you know, bunches of bullets were shot. Four of them made it into him. Wow. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, you always think, oh, some of that Wild West stuff's probably enhanced or made up. But that was a true Wild West story. And that family, you know, they knew Mark Twain and some other, you know, characters in early California. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. That's really neat. That's cool. You know, on your own family genealogy, does, was there something that you really learned that really kind of was like, mm, wow, that's, that's kind of wild or you didn't know or something that, I don't know, just – maybe even was a pat on the back to what you do that made you even feel good about doing this type of work? Was there something you found out? Uh, well, there's been a lot of great people and, and characters. Um, the one that's continued to challenge me that I'm still working on today, and I and I, I have not published this one chapter of my wife's family. Uh, her grandmother was a Franklin, and so, of course, everybody with the last name Franklin grows up hearing they're related to Benjamin Franklin, who, like George Washington, uh, well, he had offspring, but he had no supposed male offspring. You know, the line died out. He had an illegitimate son who had an illegitimate son, and that was it. But her great-great-grandfather's name, this is a mouthful, was Santorelli Sydenham Galitzin Franklin. And that name was given to him in 1827 in Mississippi by his illiterate parents. So they weren't reading, you know, the writings of Benjamin Franklin or Philadelphia Magazine or something like that. So the story had to get passed down. Well, who Santorelli, Sydenham, and Galitzin were, were three uh, foreign guys that were in Paris when Benjamin Franklin was there working uh, on the Treaty of Paris. And so uh, Santorelli was an Italian count, and he's pretty well documented. Lord Sydenham's a, a, a title that moves through every generation. And then Prince Galitzin, who was a famous Russian general, and he taught Benjamin Franklin about music. So these were real people that were tied into Benjamin Franklin. And uh, so I've continued to uh, search to try and figure out. I know who his father is and supposedly who his grandfather is, but these people didn't leave a whole lot of uh, documentation. My theory is this came through uh, Santorelli's mother's side, who was a Jones, and the Jones were Mississippi um, aristocrats. And uh, that family... Um, came out of Philadelphia, went up and down the Gulf Coast, owned uh, rum, molasses, slaves, sugar, you know, everything that was traded in the Gulf Coast uh, back in the day. One of the guys was an American consul, British consul, Spanish consul, French, you know, all the stuff around New Orleans. But uh, one of his brothers was John Jones. Well, John Jones was known as the father of American surgery. He was not only George Washington's doctor and attended him on his deathbed, oh. He was Benjamin Franklin's doctor. <laughs> so I have this little sneaking theory that I don't think I'll, I'll never be able to prove that it came down through the Jones side from Benjamin Franklin to John Jones to his Jones descendant niece that uh, married a Franklin and said, hey, well, I got this story. Why don't you use this name? 
Neat. Yeah, so I'm still That's working really on that. That's really cool. One. Yeah. I like that. We, I, I got to find out what happens on that one. I feel like I'm like it's, it's kind of cool. It's tracking down that story. So, lasting thoughts. You know, I know that family is really important to you, and I, I get it's part of the reason why you got in it. Um, you know, if if people are thinking about doing it, if there's a listener that's thinking about, hey, I want to check that out. You know, any thoughts for them and, and why it really helps to solidify or, or to really kind of paint the picture. Well, it depends on your interest level. If you have a tremendous amount of interest, people, you know, go and get accounts on the, the various um, companies out there that sell, you know, websites and, and, I mean, access to a website and access to records that go on, uh, you can pull in. But if you don't have that amount of interest or time um, to do that, then I would recommend that they look for a genealogist, a family historian uh, to work on it for them. Of course, that's what I do. Uh, because if you don't have the passion and the interest, it's just too hard to do. You know, you just you can't force yourself to love it if you don't love it. You've just got to have, you know, a weird brain. <laughs> to and where do people find you? Uh, so if somebody's interested in, in kind of learning more or, or hiring you, where would they find you? So they go to www.dancestorsgenealogy.com. And uh, there's all kinds of great information there on the website. There's lots of videos. There's lots of testimonials from our satisfied clients. And you just fill out the contact us. And uh, we'll be right back to you and get you in queue. Awesome, Dan. Well, I've learned so much and so many interesting stories. I'll have to have you back on the show. That'd be great. Awesome. Well, it, wonderful time. Uh, Dan, so what's the what's the web address again? www.dancestorsgenealogy.com. Awesome. Awesome. I'll look forward to having you back in studio. Great show today for all y'all listening. You know, it's all about family. It's all about connectivity. I mean, some of you have wonderful families that you really love. Some of you not so much, but some of you really do care about that lineage and knowing more information and kind of understanding from where you came. And I think that also helps us to form that that reality or that look or, or, or the picture that we want to know a little bit more about. I also think sometimes learning more about ourselves is so important about the family, but it all comes down to you. It's about learning who you are, understanding who you are, embracing who you are, letting go of those preconceived notions and those things that no longer serve you to actually find your own true perspective. I hope this show is connected with you. Please share it with your family and friends. Remember to live your true life and live your true life perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back in. Well, you know I'll be back this time in three shakes.